Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. You are at, at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University, and this is our regular seminar series that meets every Thursday. Last week, if you were able to join us, we had a panel discussion on the November election in the United States, and this week we continue to discuss American politics and the recently released book, Four Threats, the Recurring Crisis of, Crises of American Democracy. Um, if you were here in person, there would be a stack of these books and a Stanford library representative or Stanford bookstore representative ready to sell you these books. Alas, that's not possible, but you are likely sitting at a computer and I do highly recommend uh, buying this book and reading it. It's a really informative and rich way to think about our current crisis um, in the context of the history of the United States. So before we move on to our speakers, I just want to remind you that if you have questions during their talk, you can type them into the Q&A. We plan to leave plenty of time for discussion and we'll wrap up here around 1230. So to introduce our speakers, we're joined today by two fabulous political scientists. Robert Lieberman is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Political Science at Johns Hopkins University. He previously served as the Provost of Johns Hopkins and Dean of Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs and also Suzanne Mettler, who is the John L. Senior Professor of American Institutions in the Government Department at Cornell University. She was a 2019 Radcliffe Fellow and was recently inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So without further ado, Rob and Suzanne. Great, thank you so much, Didi, and thank you for welcoming us to Stanford. We're thrilled to be with all of you, and of course, I only wish we could be there in person. Uh, we uh, have so much respect for what all of you, of you are doing out there and are really looking forward to having this conversation with you. So let me set the scene. As the election neared, Americans grew increasingly anxious. Polarization had been growing for years, both among elected officials and ordinary citizens. Every conflict seemed to take on the proportions of an existential crisis. Now, with the election looming, people feared that if their opponents won, they would destroy the very future of the nation. They worried about violence, whatever the outcome. The year was 1800. It capped off a tumultuous first decade of governance under the new US Constitution. Several of the founders of the nation who themselves had previously disparaged political parties were among those who started to build them once they became embroiled in policy disputes. The Federalists who dominated the government took a heavy handed approach with President George Washington himself leading troops into Western Pennsylvania to put down the Whiskey Rebellion and President John Adams signing the Alien and Sedition Acts to deport immigrants who favored the opposition, the Republicans, and to outlaw criticism of the government. Republican leaders for their part tried to resist with Jefferson and Madison helping states to pass resolutions that effectively nullified those laws. With the election looming, state, uh, states that were led by Republicans stockpiled arms while the Federalists took steps to ready federal arsenals. Americans feared that self-government might not survive, that it might be replaced by aristocracy or monarchy, or, or that secession or, or civil war would destroy the nation. The election took place and the result was deadlocked. It was thrown into the House of Representatives, which was dominated by the Federalists. So what would they do? There was one possibility that they might choose outright usurpation and install one of their own. Three anxious months passed before Congress convened. Uh, they began balloting on February 11th and took vote after vote, day after day, and the impasse remained. Finally, one person changed his mind, and on the 36th ballot, Jefferson won the election. So for the first time, the presidency changed hands from one party to another, and it managed to do so peacefully. During the 1790s, fractious political polarization nearly did the nation in during its very first decade of governance. It threatened three pillars of democracy, the rule of law, the legitimacy of the opposition, and the integrity of rights. The point is that early American democracy was fragile. So the overarching question for our book, and Didi, if you could now take us to the um, first slide and actually to the, the second slide, that would be great. Uh, the overarching question is, 
is U.S. democracy in peril today? Um, so um, there are good reasons, of course, to think that it's not. Um, there are good reasons to think that, um, that in fact, democracy is safe and uh, it's been around for a long time. We have the world's oldest constitution um, and complete with checks and balances. And while the 1790s certainly wouldn't meet our standards for democracy today, um, and the United States arguably did not become a democracy until uh, the 1960s and 1970s, that it has progressed over time and become more robust and inclusive. And so that makes democracy appear to be secure. On the other hand, it's not unreasonable to wonder whether, short of a military takeover, democracy may nonetheless be at risk of deteriorating or backsliding. Scholars who study democracies around the world tell us that we don't tend to see democracy taken at the barrel of a gun these days or canceled elections or the disbanding of the legislature. Rather, it tends to happen in more subtle ways. Typically, elections are still held and yet democracy decays and the nation becomes a hybrid with some democratic features but not others. Um, so uh, the question is whether we might see deterioration of some of the features of democracy backsliding in the direction of a competitive, what might be called competitive authoritarianism. So we set out to study how the United States, with its own institutional arrangements, has fared at five earlier periods in history when Americans were concerned about backsliding. And we consider the patterns that ensued, and then we analyze the present in that light. Now by democracy, what we mean is a system of government with representatives that are chosen through competitive elections through which citizens can hold them accountable. And then they engage in collective decision-making to be responsive to the electorate, or at least that's the ideal. And we think there are four pillars of democracy necessary to make it work. The first of these, of course, and here we could go to the next slide. Uh, is free and fair elections. It's fundamental for individuals to have the right to decide who their representatives are. Second, the rule of law. The idea that a society is not governed by personal power of one, of one or a few individuals, but rather by a set of rules that applies equally to everyone. The third principle is legitimacy of the opposition. And here what we mean is that those who hold different views need to be able to organize and compete for political power, to govern when they win elections, and when they lose, to look forward to doing so the next time around with a chance of winning. Fourth and finally, integrity of rights. This is the idea that all citizens need to have the right to participate in politics and to have equal civic standing and inclusion in society. And civil liberties, civil rights, and voting rights are essential for this. So these are the four features that we use that give us indicators we can assess in the five historical periods we look at to see whether democracy is uh, advancing or retreating. So these are our dependent variables, if you will. Now, if we, if we could go to uh, the next slide. The independent variables we look at, the threats to democracy, we've learned about from uh, learning from comparativists, scholars who study the rise and decline of democracy around the world today. And you'll see from our list here, these four things, that uh, all four of these threats rage at high levels in American politics today. And they're all quite familiar to us. We've been as social scientists hearing about each of these trends for a long time. But the question Rob and I asked is, what makes them dangerous to democracy? Because as scholars of American politics, we really haven't been thinking about that as much as our colleagues who study countries around the world. So next slide, please. Uh, the first one that we examine is political polarization. Now, democracy works well when there are multiple groups and identities in a society and people have overlapping and cross-cutting affiliations. What's problematic is when these differences increasingly align and people sort themselves into camps of us and them. Uh, and this leads people to become intolerant of one another, political psychologists find. They tend to become more angry and resentful of the other side. So politics becomes more like mortal combat, where one thinks of their opponents as enemies. Now, among lawmakers, the political parties in the U.S. Congress increasingly act, as Francis Lee shows, as partisan teams. Since about 1980s, the parties have been fiercely competitive 
uh, from one election to the next, and either one could win the majority in every election. And the way they've responded is to try to emphasize their differences. So party leaders uh, discipline those who step out of line and would dare to work with the other side. And they increasingly devote resources to public relations campaigns that try to emphasize their differences with the other party, rather than putting their time and resources toward policymaking, which relies on negotiation and mutual accommodation. So helping one's team to win becomes the exclusive priority at all costs, and that can be dangerous to democracy. Um, then in the next slide, we look at conflict over the boundaries of the political community. Democracy works well when people agree who is a member and what their status is. An unresolved formative rift in the nation's founding over who is included can reemerge as a source of trouble again and again. And here I'm drawing on the work of Jennifer McCoy and her colleagues uh, such as Murat Summer. Uh, in the periods we examine, battles over race take center stage, especially those who were most ex uh, overtly excluded in the nation's founding, African Americans. These conflicts can foster backsliding when that conflict is organized or structured along the lines of the party system. And one party wants to restore what uh, Roger Smith has called a script of American traditions at all costs. The language might be that we need to preserve our way of life or our culture or our heritage. And then the other, when the other side wants greater equality. And if this conflict is combined with political polarization, it can become particularly combustible. And it's often used as a tool by polarizers. Um, on the, the next slide, we look at rising economic inequality. The United States is the most unequal nation in the world today that's still considered a democracy. And places where inequality is high and growing are more likely to suffer democratic deterioration. Now, it's, you know, when I first heard about this, I thought this meant that the 99% would rise up and have a revolution uh, against the top 1%. But in fact, the idea is actually the opposite of that. It's that as inequality grows, the affluent become worried that the masses will impose redistributive policies and higher taxes. So to protect their interests, the rich seek to solidify their power, and they're willing to support re repressive measures if that's what it takes, and they're willing to do so at all costs. Saving democracy is not their priority. And here again, you see the combination of these first three threats that I've mentioned can really be toxic. And now for the fourth threat, we go to the next slide, executive aggrandizement. Uh, this refers to the enlargement and concentration of the powers of the nation's top leader, which makes a nation more prone to tyranny. Um, and this has happened in the United States over time, particularly since the 1930s, in part because Congress has delegated powers to the president. Um, but presidents of both parties have uh, left the, the, um, the executive branch more powerful than, they, uh, than what they inherited when they came along. Um, Theodore Lowy foresaw, I think, where we are today in many ways when he wrote about the plebiscitary presidency in the 1980s um, and a president's using technology to communicate very directly to the people and trying to use the powers of the federal government to respond to their demands. And uh, Sidney Milkis has also written about how presidents engage in partisan efforts to respond to their to their um, partisan supporters by using the powers of the administrative state. So combined with the other threats, you get the potential for weaponization of the presidency, um, and it gives presidents the capacity to, um, to, to really um, wield all of those other threats quite effectively. So as all four of these threats have waxed and waned and combined in different ways in American history, um, they've really wreaked havoc um, and caused um, threats to democracy. Um, I mentioned earlier the 1790s when there was really just one threat that was looming large, polarization, and it almost brought about the undoing of the nation. In the 1850s, three threats combined and it led to the outbreak of the Civil War. Um, but now I wanna to turn to the 1890s on the next slide. Now, in the decades following the Civil War, 
American men were active in electoral politics at high rates. It was a time when democracy, for those who had the right to participate, was quite vibrant. And this now included African American men in the South who gained voting rights and began to participate at high rates in elections and running for office, primarily as Republicans. And many were elected uh, not only to the US Congress, as shown in this slide, but uh, also to uh, lots of state and local positions as well. And they continued to do so right up into the 1890s, long after the formal end to Reconstruction. Also, the People's Party, or the populists, emerged and uh, out of the uh, and also began to run candidates quite successfully. And in the South, many populists became elected to state legislatures. But at that very juncture, democracy was thrown into crisis. So now I want to zoom into North Carolina in the 1980s. And we can go to the next slide. Um, there, Republicans and populists noticed that if they joined forces running candidates on what was called a fusionist ballot, they stood a chance of beating Democrats. And that's what they did. In 1896, the fusionists managed to elect Republicans as governor to several seats in the U.S. House of Representatives and to take a majority in the state assembly. Democrats' worst fears had come to pass and they plotted their way back to power and indeed to domination. In 1898, they organized an, uh, a campaign of threats and intimidation statewide, intimidating Republicans from running candidates or voting, and they stoked white supremacy bringing lower and middle income whites back into the fold to support the Democratic Party. They stuffed ballot boxes and they managed to win back the majority in the state legislature. Then two days later, they staged a coup d'etat in the coastal city of Wilmington. Now Wilmington at that time was a city in which African Americans were moving into the middle class. Three members of the Board of Aldermen were black, as were numerous public sector employees. The Daily Record was a Black-owned newspaper, and it was the only daily of its, of its kind in the nation. Democracy seemed to be on the rise until the morning of November 10th, when nearly 2,000 white men uh, with rifles and pistols gathered at the city armory. They belonged to two paramilitary groups, as shown on this slide, the White Government Union and those on the left. Oh, go back one slide. Those on the left are the red shirts. Uh, but now go to the next slide. They marched directly to the offices of the Daily Record, shown here, and they set the building on fire and watched it burn. They then proceeded into black neighborhoods and murdered hundreds of residents. They dragged prominent people from their homes and threw them in jail or took them straight to the train station and made them leave town. The Democratic leaders then, at gunpoint, forced the resignation of the mayor and aldermen and installed their own in their place. A few months later, the Democrats took measures to make their power permanent. They scaled back voting rights via poll taxes and literacy tests, as shown on the next slide. As one Democrat, a state senator, put it, he favored, quote, a good square honest law that will always give us a good Democratic majority, end quote. What happened in North Carolina, and particularly in Wilmington, brought out into the open a major transformation that was happening all over the South at that time, as white elites in the Democratic Party sought to shut down the political opposition once and for all. In most states, it occurred through mostly legal processes, such as uh, low, visibi low visibility con constitutional conventions, as well as through the stuffing of ballot boxes and miscounting votes, etc. The federal government permitted this and stood by, uh, and this included Republican presidents and the, the opposition party. 1898, President McKinley heard the pleas of African Americans in Wilmington and failed to respond, to intervene. As disenfranchisement happened in state after state, President Theodore Roosevelt simply watched. Then President Taft went so far as to praise the restrictive rules for excluding from voting what he called an ignorant, irresponsible element. The result was the disenfranchisement of millions of black men uh, for decades to come. By the same stroke, white Southern elites regained extra political power, not only to rule in their own states as autocrats, but also to exercise an outsized voice in national politics for the next 50 years. By the end of the 1890s, all four characteristics of democracy had suffered harm. Southern Democrats not only failed to recognize the legitimacy of the political opposition, but they sought to terminate it. They succeeded in doing so by eviscerating the voting rights of African Americans. As they pursued that goal to consolidate power, they ran elections in ways that were anything but free and fair. Oh, this is all in the next slide, sorry. 
um, any, in uh, ways that were anything but free and fair, and they did not hesitate to thwart the rule of law. As a result of these blows to democracy, more harm ensued. Once blacks had lost voting rights, once they'd lost political power, their civil liberties and civil rights were trampled as well. And then to the next slide. A democratic backsliding in the 1890s was hardly inevitable. Three threats to democracy coalesced and political leaders took advantage of them in ways that led to severe backsliding. Uh, that racism drove backsliding was plain to see. Uh, white supremacy was used by Southern Democrats because it was a very effective political strategy to, to unify whites uh, and to sanction the removal from the electorate members of the opposition. The decade also featured a high degree of polarization between the parties. Uh, Southern Democrats stoked that. And economic inequality was soaring. And although elites were divided between the North and the South, they each pursued their own goals and the deterioration of democracy was of little concern to them. Although much has changed, nonetheless, the politics of the 1890s reverberates in our own times. Then as now, we witness a high degree of polarization and rising economic inequality. Some political leaders use race baiting, including that directed toward immigrants to fuel white supremacy uh, and um, to fuel anger and to promote political participation among white supporters. And white supremacy and polarization animate politics and can obscure the purposeful activities of economic elites to achieve their policy goals. And now I'm gonna turn things over to Rob. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, Didi, if you can take the slides down now, I'm gonna talk without slides for a few minutes and I'll ask you to um, put them back up. Uh, so thanks, um, uh, thanks all. I wanted to add my thanks to Didi and to CDDRL for having us there wherever there uh, is. Um, but let me pick up the story uh, in the 20th century after um, this really electrifying uh, story about the 1890s. Um, the story of American politics in the 20th century is really a story about the fourth threat, the one that hasn't really appeared yet so much in the 19th century, and that is executive aggrandizement. And we pick up that story in the uh, 1930s um, with uh, the ascendance of Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt took power um, in March of 1933 at a moment of deep economic and political crisis. Um, this was the trough of the depression and an era, a moment when um, Americans and people in democratic regimes all over the world feared that liberal democracy as had, 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 had come to be known was um, about to meet its demise. Um, and many expected and even hoped that Franklin Roosevelt would assume essentially dictatorial powers. Um, including liberals, outspoken liberals like the columnist um, uh, Walter Lippmann, who urged him to do so. And the Roosevelt administration actually opened with an extraordinary act of presidential power when the, the president, um, on his third day in office, shut down uh, uh, the banks uh, so that the new uh, government could um, figure out what to do to stabilize the financial system. In the end, Roosevelt did not assume what we would call dictatorial power, but he did leave the presidency much more powerful than he found it, um, largely because Congress gave him power, not because he seized power. Uh, a lot of this story is well known, the growth of the administrative state, the growth of the White House, um, the attempt to pack the court uh, after the 1936 election, um, a, a increasingly relevant uh, example uh, this week. Um, and uh, of course, the uh, executive order to incarcerate Japanese Americans during World War uh, II, less well known, is um, a secret order that Roosevelt signed in 1940. This was a, in the period when Europe was at war, but the United States was still sitting on the sidelines. And, and Roosevelt um, was extremely worried about the Nazi threat in Europe and about Nazi subversion or what was understood to be extensive Nazi subversion in the United States. Um, and he signed a secret order in, in 1940 that was actually authored by J. Edgar Hoover, the director of, of the FBI, um, authorizing illegal wiretapping in the United States in response to these fears of Nazi and to a lesser extent communist uh, activity in the United States, targeted mostly at foreign nationals, um, but actually gave the intelligence services a fair bit of leeway uh, to target US citizens as well. So there's a, there's a um, there's a sense that the Roosevelt expansion of executive power uh, 
helped save democratic capitalism in the United States, but also it had this dark underside. Um, it didn't systematically uh, challenge the foundational racial inequality um, that underlay the American regime and that was hardened in the 1890s, as Suzanne just described. And it created this new set of tools of executive power that grew over the ensuing decades with the establishment and expansion of the national security state. Um, and in the hands of a less uh, uh, constrained and less scrupulous president, uh, Richard Nixon in the 1970s, these tools became essentially a set of political weapons that, um, that uh, Nixon was able to deploy, to wield, to target political enemies. Uh, we don't need to go into a uh, long, um, uh, extensive rec recitation of Watergate. I find that once I do that, I can't really stop. It's become something of an obsession. Uh, but the bottom line is that in the 1930s, and particularly in the 1970s, executive aggrandizement without the presence of the other threats, the other threats were at, rel uh, were at relatively low levels in these episodes. Even that was enough to destabilize democracy. Democracy again persisted. Um, and in fact, um, Watergate is perhaps the most pure democracy preserving moment in our story, which was I think a surprise to both Suzanne and me once we started digging into these historical episodes. Um, what, there's much more to be said about them and we're happy to talk about them in the Q&A, but in sum, what these historical episodes reveal is that American democracy has repeatedly been more fragile um, than we think. The, the United States has undergone numerous crises when democracy risks severe deterioration. And it's been a very tumultuous history, um, which is sometimes lost on people of our generation, people who are roughly our age, who came of age in the decades after World War II and the end of the 20th century, have, we have to re sometimes remind ourselves that we grew up in a relatively stable, serene period for American democracy by comparison to much of the country's history. Not that this was a placid era by any means without controversy or conflict. Um, but over and over again, uh, the nation has risked instability and violence and the demise of rights. All of the characteristics of democracy that we chronicle have been repeatedly threatened and sometimes backsliding occurred. Um, sometimes, so often with long enduring consequences. So Didi, if we can go back uh, to the slides and then advance to the next slide from where we left off. Yeah, that's, that's the one. What we discovered is that these four threats have waxed and waned and sort of combined and recombined in different uh, combinations throughout history. Um, in, in, uh, uh, in, all, in three of the earlier periods, high polarization was especially dangerous, and especially so in the presence of conflict over membership and economic inequality, as we saw in the two 19th century uh, episodes. When three threats combined, which happened in the 1850s and the 1890s, it led to the most dramatic democratic backsliding in US history. Lower polarization during the 20th century um, helped to contain what could otherwise have been um, more uh, dire crises. It's important to recognize though that the four threats by themselves don't determine what unfolds in politics. This is not intended as a sort of mechanistic argument. Um, rather political actors, they frame a set of choices that political actors have at any one time, both elites and voters. Um, and it's those choices that we make, that elected officials and citizens make and organizational leaders that really make the crucial difference in whether threats will materialize into full-scale danger um, or whether um, uh, people will choose to uh, engage in action to save democracy. One of the most sobering um, takeaways from this history uh, about the recurring crises is that the resolution of crisis has often revolved around a compromise of democratic values that entails um, reaffirming or perpetuating racial hierarchy or exclusion. And in fact, when challenges to democracy have been overcome, it's not always through heroic action by virtuous Democrats or high-minded sort of forward thinking action. Um, it's often um, the case that we've preserved a version of democracy for uh, some subset of Americans by restricting who is included in the umbrella of the promise of American democracy. And we see that time and time again. 
um, that we save democracy by making it more exclusive or by, by, by perpetuating particularly racial exclusion. And Didi, if we can move to the next slide. Today, for the first time ever, we face the convergence of all four of these threats at the same time. Um, I don't think I need to uh, belabor uh, these, you know, except to say that polarization is um, as high as it's ever been. Um, um, conflict over membership, uh, particularly over race and immigration, has fused with partisanship to an alarming degree. Um, economic inequality is rising and fuels political conflict more than uh, at any time in the last half century at least. Um, we don't have a clear measure of executive aggrandizement, but I think it's fair to say that executive power is um, at perhaps the highest point it's been in the history of the Republic. Um, it's important to recognize that the, these, the rise of these threats long predated President Trump. So he's not responsible for these, um, although he seems to have an unerring instinct to make things worse. He certainly intensified them and his, his presidency has caused uh, actual harm. Um, these threats to democracy have taken on a life of their own. Um, and we worry that they're on course to persist well beyond Trump's departure from public life, um, whenever that might be and however it comes about. Um, we're likely to undergo, uh, these, we're likely to undergo years of, of, of democratic careening, um, as Dan Slater calls it, through volatile party, volatile party conflict that could produce backsliding. And the question is really, how do we make the preservation and restoration of democracy uh, our first priority or a priority that has equal status with whatever partisan or policy goals we might uh, pursue, want to pursue? Um, uh, whether democracy can be saved, I think, depends on those kinds of choices that we make as citizens and that our leaders make under our guidance. Um, History has been full of such choices, which is one of the things we learned in, in writing this book. Um, in some instances, people have chosen a destructive path as in the 1890s, as Suzanne just narrated. In others, they found a much more productive way forward, um, such as by enacting both bipartisan post-Watergate reforms that tried at least for a time um, to rein in the uh, runaway executive power. But if history is any guide, we can't take for democracy for granted and we need to make restoring it uh, a, a top priority, even though these days that seems to be an ever more elusive goal. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and we'll be happy to uh, take some questions and have a conversation. All right, well, thank you both for that great presentation, um, albeit a little bit dispiriting. Um, I'd like to start by asking you about the future, which I know this book is about the past. Um, you know, in the short term, we have a president who's saying that he's not really going to leave office and that he thinks the election is not going to be legitimate. And we know that Americans now feel that institutions don't really work on their behalf. They felt that way long before Trump. And if anything, Trump capitalized on that kind of sentiment in order to do as well as he did in the 2015 primaries, um, ultimately winning the presidency. So my question for you is when, when you say free and fair elections is fundamental to democracy, that's obviously true. But is there something else that we might think about? So free and fair elections require um, each person's vote to be weighed equally. And yet we have institutions that don't really count votes equally, whether it's the malapportioned Senate that allocates California with its 39 million people to senators to Wyoming's to. Um, the House of Representatives also typically gives a seat bump. So that means that a party that wins a plurality can win a majority of seats. And we know the Electoral College is also you know, not a majoritarian institution. Do you think majoritarianism um, and the sort of counter-majoritarian nature of our institutions also violates one of the four pillars of democracy? So the way that we approach this in the book is that we pretty much take the constitution as given. And you know, I would certainly agree that you know, looking at some of these features of the constitution, I think they don't um, align with our a sense of democracy today as being more like one person, one vote, and that's really not the way the Senate and the Electoral College um, uh, reflects that principle. Um, and yet, um, you know, we think that changing the Constitution is is really hard, and it's particularly hard when you have high 
polarization and when these things are baked in that are advantaging the side that benefits from those features. So um, we've tried to, in the book, look at lower hang what we think are, what we hope are lower hanging fruit. And that is to um, underscore the importance of these pillars of democracy, which we think that Americans still across the party divide still uh, value these features. And to, you know, so our, our call at the end of the book is for to people to really value those and to protect and preserve them. Um, you know, I certainly think that it would be great to have reforms that would um, would correct for some of those features that you're mentioning, but I, I don't see that as, an, as a, a goal that's very likely in the near term. I can just add one thing to that. Um, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's clearly true that the Constitution has these anti-majoritarian features that you noted, Dee Dee. Um, but it's also true that for most of American history, um, we've managed to, they don't always have these counter-majorian effects, right? We're living in a moment when, because of the way the parties are aligned and because of the way voters are aligned and because of these divisions, um, we, we're, um, the, the, the counter-majoritarian features of the constitution are being exposed, right? Two out of the last five elections have been decided by a minority, by, a, by the, right? In two out of the last five presidential elections, the candidate that got fewer votes won the election, right? Um, so we all know that this is happening, but that doesn't have to, that's partly a feature of the way the threats have converged right now. Um, and because the presidency is so powerful and because of um, gridlock elsewhere in the system, the, the prize of the presidency is more valuable than ever before. Um, so it's not just the constitutional structure that has led us here. It's the constitutional structure with all of these other threats layered on top of it. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind. Okay, we have another question from Frank Fukuyama, the director of CDDRL, who's asking if there's any historical precedent when you were researching this book for a president announcing in advance that um, he or, or she, but you know, historically, it's been he won't accept an election result that goes against, against him. Not that I've ever found. Yeah. Um, Certainly not that I've come across either. Yeah. I mean, there are, there, there, there is a lot, of, there are a lot of examples, not so much in presidential elections, but in other elections of, I mean, I guess in 1800, of, of, of fear of an illegitimate election or um, all kinds of skullduggery and violence and intimidation and fraud around elections, right? So elections have always been seen as these sort of high stakes affairs. And in these moments of polarization, um, and especially polarization when amplified by these other things, um, there's this sort of win at all costs attitude that, that, that actors will take in these, in these elections. So in the election of 1800, um, in elections in Kansas, in the 1850s, in the 1890s in North Carolina, um, you know, elections devolve into violence or are on the verge of violence um, because it's seen as illegitimate and, and, and calamitous when the other side wins. Um, <laughs> And Rob, in, in particular, you might mention the 1860 election. Yeah, no, and the 1860 election is an example of, of an election where, and this was essentially two separate elections, right? There were four candidates. Um, there were Lincoln and Douglas who competed in the North and Brecker, Breckenridge and Bell who competed in the South. Lincoln wasn't even on the ballot in the South um, in 10 states. So, um, you know, it's, it's not a case of, um, uh, you know, I don't know that a candidate said in advance what our President Trump has said in the last, well, for the last four years, really. Um, but that was clearly in the air, the, the fear that this, illegit this election, no matter what the outcome, would be seen as illegitimate by one side or the other. Okay. Okay, so a question that's maybe hopefully taking a little more of an optimistic take. How has the country um, overcome some of these crises in the past? What are the strategies that you've seen that addressed these multiple dangers? And how do you diminish the threats while also propping up democracy as a sort of norm that, that needs to be upheld? Was this 
purely a leadership thing or was it also a lot of civic activity, civil resistance, um, either protest or just a lot of civic activity at the ballot box, for example? How have you found that we were able to emerge from these crises? So I think we started this book project with the hope that we would come up with an answer to that question that we found really satisfying and uplifting. And I regret to say that's really not how it panned out. I mean, we could look at Watergate, that we came out of Watergate more successfully than any of the other crises that we mentioned. Um, in that time period, you had all of the different political actors in the system um, outside of the White House played their constitutionally prescribed roles. Um, and you had, you know, members of Congress in both parties who really seriously investigated the president. Um, and uh, then the Supreme Court played its role. Um, members of the media played their role. Um, and after uh, it was all said and done um, and Nixon left office, then there were reforms, bipartisan reforms in Congress. But of course, at that point in time in the 1970s, while you know Nixon was really using uh, executive aggrandizement to for his own personal and political gain, the other threats were ebbing at a low level. Um, the country had much less political polarization. There were liberals and conservatives in both parties at that point in time, um, and economic inequality was just you know beginning to grow, but it was far more egalitarian society in those respects. And um, we, you know, just come out of the civil rights reforms. So um, th there was, and, and they had been supported um, by both Democrats and, and Republicans ultimately. So, um, so they were not, that conflict over who belongs was not aligned with party either at that moment. So it was more possible for that to happen. In our other periods, as you know, Rob is saying, there was often a settlement um, that, um, was is profoundly disturbing, and either the um, the conflict played out in a way where conflict over race was suppressed, which was the case in the 1790s and the 1930s, or there it was out in the open and it was um, it fell along party lines, and the settlement ultimately had to do with reinstating racial hierarchy, and certainly you see that in the story of the 1890s that I described that happens. So I think for, the, for us today, um, when we have the, all these threats um, raging, the question is, can we do something that really hasn't been done before in American history? And that is, can we come out of this era trying to make the system more democratic and more inclusive rather than going in this regressive direction? I, I, think, I think also, yeah, I mean, that is the kind of dispiriting um, conclusion that we reached. Um, I think if we had written the book differently, that is, if we had included the democratizing moments in American history, and particularly the first reconstruction, for the, re the two reconstructions, the re reconstruction of the late 19th century and the civil rights revolution of the late 20th century, I think we might have seen the answer to that question differently. Um, because I think there is a story that connects those two uh, those two episodes around movement activity and partisan alignment and coalition building around a more democratic, pro-democratic and racially reformative um, agenda. Um, um, but we, but I think um, you know the focus the the focus that we took was on the threats um, and and um, sadly, the story of the these threatening moments and these moments of backsliding is not really a heroic one, as you just said. Okay, we, we often, have, we often oh, felt like there was a thousand page book trying to burst out of our three hundred page. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, this is a good. This is a good start. You can this save that start, for. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so there's a question now about foreign policy. Uh, two two elements. First is, to what extent has executive aggrandizement? Um, in foreign policy, particularly around national security, contributed to these threats um, or to domestic instability? And the second question is, how should or can our allies respond, like those in Western, the Western world, um, if we do have an election crisis or, or a prolonged political crisis? You know, what is going to be the response from the international community and how would the United States respond? What has happened historically? 
Um, on the first part of the question, yes, absolutely. The, um, the uh, foreign policy commitments of the United States, um, especially during and after World War II, are an important, very important part of the story of executive aggrandizement. And we, we tell that story only very sketchily in the book, but it's there, it's part of the scaffolding. Um, what we do uh, chronicle, that's the connective tissue between the, the Roosevelt uh, episodes and Watergate is the growth of the national security state and all of the apparatus that goes along with it, um, both in terms of the sort of legal empowerment of the president and the executive branch, the growth of the executive branch, and the development of the kinds of tools of, um, of surveillance and spycraft and, and whatnot that um, become sort of ordinary, everyday part and parcel of the president's toolkit. Um, so that by the time the 1970s comes around um, and Nixon is confronted with the Pentagon Papers leak and the anti-war movement um, and, uh, um, and his own political demands and personal anxieties and demons, he has this incredible bag of tools that he can use to um, target uh, his enemies um, that's, not a, that's not a foreign policy move per se, but it comes out of the foreign policy arsenal that's been built with the national security state. You see that with the Bush uh, uh, you know, surveillance programs in the early 21st century as well. Um, so that's, a, that's a, line, a story. We don't tell it in great detail, but it's an important um, scaffolding for the story about economic, about, I'm sorry, uh, executive aggrandizement in the 20th and into the 21st century. I don't know, Suzanne, do you want to try and tackle the uh, international relations question? See, yeah. I took the easy you, one. You've done a good job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's really outside of, the, outside of the scope of what we deal with in the book, but I, I like your answer, Rob. All right, so the next question, or there's actually a little batch of questions about social media and information. So we know that the US has historically had partisan information, um, party pamphlets, that kind of thing, but since, since I guess the tech revolutions and media in particular, we know information can travel very quickly and sometimes it is fake information. We've had foreign interference in our information environment. So do you think that technology provides um, an amplification of the threat or do you think that it could be used to mitigate the threat and why? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And, you know, I, I will speculate about it. I, I, I know there are people who study this in in much greater depth, but I'll, I'll speculate about it just based on what we see across our historical cases. Um, it was really striking to us. I mean, we, we think of ourselves as today living in an era where we have real partisan media, particularly Fox News and lots of talk radio, et cetera. Um, but um, in the early 1790s, you know, no sooner was the ink dry on the Constitution than some of the uh, the founding fathers themselves were creating the nation's first partisan media, um, and uh, and you know doing so very quickly. And uh, they were going after each other in uh, these news partisan newspapers that were created, um, and. Uh, that really helped to uh, create the beginnings of political parties and it helped to, you know, create the, the sense of what each party stood for um, and it really fueled division. They wrote anonymous op-eds, you know, Hamilton on the one side, which someone said that some of that is depicted in the musical Hamilton, um, and then uh, Jefferson and Madison on the other. Um, and we found this was, a, you know, a theme that ran through um, are different cases is that the media and technology of the era was used by enterprising politicians um, and polarizing politicians to try to get the word out um, to their supporters and to try to recruit supporters and to solidify their base, etc. Um, and you know we see this time and again. And and I think you know it it can be used um, to help allow citizens to become more active in democracy. And we certainly saw many instances of that. It seemed like, you know, democratic values that we would like to support. Um, and, but sometimes not so much. So, um, so I don't know, you know, it, it could be that with contemporary um, media, uh, 
and with the technology of the day, it's just much easier to communicate with so many people and such a high proportion of the public so quickly that that becomes, you know, particularly perilous, but also maybe has particular amount of promise to it. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure that I, I don't think I would blame technology um, so much as, as saying that it's a tool that can be used in, in either way. Rob, do you want to add to that? No, I don't have anything else to say. Okay, so in our final nine minutes or so, I'll ask a question um, that's, I guess, a little bit more of an academic question, but of the four independent variables you cite, they could also, you know, they're not really independent, right, like, or of each other, that is. They can be reinforcing, um, or it could be something like economic inequality contributes to polarization, something like that. So could you say a little bit more about how you think the variables might be linked um, or why it is that when they get together in certain combinations, they're, they're more likely to be a threat? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we do, we do essentially present them as independent, but we know, of course, they're not independent of each other, although they do, you know, come and go sort of on their own temporal scale and in their own ways. But what is particularly notable is the way they combine and then reinforce each other. So Suzanne, for example, described the way in which um, at, a, at, at times when polarization is already existing, you know, racial conflict becomes a tool that polarizers can use, polarizing politicians um, can use to um, uh, rile up their supporters, to gain supporters, to define the difference between our side and the other side. Um, and economic inequality in, in this in much the same. I mean, um, you know, if there's a if there's a sort of populist vector that repeats itself in American history, it's that. It's the it's the um, it's not so much economic conflict, but it's racial conflict that's used to mask economic conflict. That's used to unify whites um, uh, across economic classes to forestall the. Um, uh, the the combination of lower class uh, of whites and blacks against the wealthy. Um, so there's so the there's it's very important to the way we portray these threats in the book that they combine in these ways that sort of can be mutually reinforcing. Um, and then of course when you add onto that um, tinderbox when you throw the spark of executive aggrandizement. So, you know, when you have a, a, a highly polarized situation with a extremely powerful presidency um, who has then more tools at his disposal to use in these politically um, um, contentious ways, uh, the situation becomes um, uh, uh, even more dangerous. Great. Suzanne, if there's nothing to add, Okay, so the final question is also sort of grouping some different questions I'm seeing about what organizations and citizens can do after November. If the, let's just assume that the election is going to be a little bit of a mess. It's gonna be very unprecedented. This is a pandemic. We're not going to have a result on election night. We might not have- A, a little bit of a mess is about the best we can hope for. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's not appropriate to say the other things I think it could be. Um, but, you know, January 20th, it's sort of an open question about what's going to happen. And we know that some Republican senators have come out and said there will be a peaceful transition of power. But so far, Republican senators have not really done a good job forestalling some of the president's other activities. So the question is, historically, or just from what you're seeing today, what can citizens do to try to preserve or ensure a peaceful transition? Or what organizations do you think will be important? You noted that in a time of economic inequality and polarization, you know, the capitalist class tends to side with the government and want to preserve um, its wealth. But surely it is bad for the capitalist class to have the United States be so unstable. So do you see any um, sort of elite factions or citizen politics emerging that could help with a peaceful transition? Yikes. Suzanne, what do you got? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a tough one, and it's a tough one at this um, stage of the game too. Um, 
someone asked me a few days ago when I was telling the story of the 1890s, they said, if you, if, uh, you know, before that coup happened in Wilmington in November 1898, if you could have gone back there in October to 1898 and warned people, you know, what would you say? And, you know, at that juncture, at this juncture, it's difficult because you've got all these threats raging and um, things are pretty far down the road and it's pretty hard for ordinary citizens to do a lot aside from, um, you know, obviously voting. Um, and I think um, for those of us who live in areas with low transmission rates and who don't have underlying conditions, I, I think it's good to try to vote in person. Mm -hmm. um, and um, though I'm, I'm not a public health expert, so I'm not, you know, <laughs> giving that as public health advice. Um, and, uh, and then I think um, to be, you know, contacting elected officials along the way and to making them aware of, of concerns that we have. Um, and, you know, I think there may well be people taking to the streets um, about the organizations that can, um, can help us out. That's a good question. And I really should find an answer to that. I don't know, Rob, do you? Have any thoughts? Yeah, no, I don't have much more to sadly don't have much more to say. I mean, look, if, if Trump steals the election, then I think people are going to be in the streets. I think there's no way around that. Um, and then I think for the United States, we're in really uncharted territory. Um, because then we're in a situation where, um, you know, all of the pillars of democracy have pretty much crumbled, right? Um, you know, free and fair elections are gone, rule of law is gone the idea that there's a legitimate opposition is gone um, and rights are really in peril. Uh, so, you know, in a way that's the easiest answer is if, if, if the election is stolen, um, then we're, we're in a very, very drastic uh, uh, situation. It's in that big, fuzzy, messy middle, you know, and if, if, if Biden wins a decisive victory and it's declared on election night, that might be the, 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 the other poll, right? It's the big fuzzy middle, which is probably where we're more likely to end up, where there's weeks of uncertainty. And, you know, I was just teaching my students this morning uh, the about the 2000 election. So if we have, I don't know, whatever the 2020 equivalent of hanging chads in Florida for weeks on end, um, that's gonna be very hard. And there, I think those kinds of voices that Suzanne was describing will be very important. Okay, well, thank you, Rob and Suzanne, for joining us today. Um, obviously, I hope that for the next 40 days or however long is left, that things are less tumultuous than, than they have been, but um, it's hard to say. At any rate, this book is unfortunately very timely, and again, for our audience, it's very, very good. Um, and thank you so much for joining us, Rob and Suzanne, and to our audience, we hope you stay safe. This video will be posted on YouTube later, and thanks. Thanks for having us. Thank you all.